So is my PowerPoint back to the beginning? Jesus, help me. No. And then which button? It's from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Oh my God. Julie. That's why I wore black. Oh, I always get it when I get nervous. So I wear black. Do we need to share our screen when it's our turn to talk? Do we share our screen when it's our turn to talk? No. No. Maureen can pick you up from down there. Okay. Sorry. Is it muted? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm holding. Anyway. So the only thing, Mommy, is your screen shared with the PowerPoint? Is it up and ready to go? Welcome to our December Parent Academy, helping kids cope with anxiety and depression during the pandemic. Tonight's recording will, tonight's presentation will be recorded and will be available on our ASD 20 website on the Parent Academy page within the next week or two. We'd like you also to know that we have a link in the chat. Uh, for an evaluation so that we can gather your feedback. We greatly value your uh, input and it helps us to continue to provide quality presentations for you on these Parent Academy nights. So if you would take a few minutes and click that link, it's a short survey that will help us immensely. Tonight, we also, um, our presenters, are our own ASD 20 mental health professionals. Particularly, we have a district suicide prevention team and these individuals serve on that team and have done an enormous amount of work um, with suicide prevention for the past eight, eight years in our district. I would like to go ahead and introduce these individuals to you. We have Mark Mackin. He is a one of our former curriculum and instruction instruction directors. He is also UCCS professor in educational psychology, and he is presently getting um, his counseling degree as well, uh, doing his graduate study at UCCS. Uh, Julie Moser is a licensed professional counselor and one of our district safe counselors that strictly works um, in with providing students with mental health services. Kristen Segrin is a licensed 
clinical social worker, also one of our district safe counselors. Linda Powell is a licensed professional counselor and one of our counselors at Air Academy High School. Rachel Lake, uh, she is unable to attend tonight. She is our special population specialist and a licensed clinical social worker, but she did do a great bit of work in some of the content that you will see tonight. And Sherry Olonogren, also a licensed professional counselor and counselor at Air Academy High School. We will have a question and answer time at the end. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and we will be uh, fielding those to our presenters uh, at the end of the presentation uh, to, to answer your questions. Again, we thank you for being here and um, we will get started. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sherry Lonergan. I'm one of the counselors at Air Academy High School and tonight's goals. Uh, we want to be talking about what is the prevalence of anxiety and depression among youth and the impact of the pandemic. Uh, we want to know um, does the prevalence vary at different ages and within the gender and what are we hearing and seeing in our community? Just some brief facts about mental health disorders in youth. We, we know that um, children ages um, 3 to 17, um, there's approximately 4.4 million that have diagnosed with anxiety, and then about 1.9 million have been diagnosed with depression, and depression and anxiety go together quite often. Um, and then children um, are diagnosed with ADHD, and there's about 6.1 million of children that have received that diagnosis and then children um, have also been diagnosed with a behavior problem 4.5 million. So this is a, a problem that we see in our schools um, and across across the country. This graph just depicts the um, onset of depression, anxiety and behavior disorders. Um, you can see that really it spikes starting in those um, middle school slash high school years and um, you know depression and anxiety are 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 very related and also um, um, we have a lot of behavior disorders with um, predominantly a lot of boys um, being diagnosed with behavior disorders as well. Hi everybody, I'm Linda Powell and I'm also a counselor at Air Academy High School. Um, what you see on this uh, slide is how the prevalence of depression um, in adolescents um, varies with age and also with gender. And you can see that it increases substantially from ages 12 through 17. And we know that this is also a significant time of change among our youth. Um, changes in terms of physical changes, social, emotional, and cognitive changes, so a lot going on. On the left-hand side of the chart, uh, the last bar graph um, shows the prevalence overall, but then you'll notice the female and male bar graphs, and the prevalence for females is about two to three times higher than that of males. Uh, we do know that males are less likely to report and also less likely to go to the doctor, so those are certainly factors. But we also know that the symptoms vary by gender. So with males, um, the symptoms might include irritability, lack of focus, uh, restlessness, uh, sleep disturbances, whereas with females, you might hear more about um, feelings of sadness, feelings of low self-esteem, self-worth, um, and also expression of physical symptoms, so something to be aware of when we're working with our youth. 
Now, while we know that the trends are pretty clear that anxiety and depression have increased um, over time and recently with our youth, the reasons why are less conclusive and more complicated. And this slide is sort of an attempt to, um, to depict that for you. There are a lot of different factors and they may vary by individual. There are some common themes though in the literature. One of them is um, just the digital world that we live in. You might say that our youth are overstimulated and hyperconnected. Um, we know that we're in, if we're in that state of uh, flight or a fight for a lengthened period of time that can certainly increase anxiety um, as well as as stress and then while connections um, hyper connectivity can be good in some sense we also know that when our youth are turning to social media for their sense of self-worth how many times um, has somebody hit on one of their social media accounts and that's how they measure their success um, that that can certainly be a challenge Another theme in terms of why is all of this happening um, is sleep disturbance and lack of sleep. On average, our youth are reporting getting less than seven hours of sleep a night, whereas um, the recommendations are that they get eight to nine hours. So that certainly has a negative uh, potential impact on mental health. Another theme that we uh, read about is sort of lack of community and being overstructured. Gone are the days when um, our youth could kind of go outside and just meet up with people and play unstructured. Um, so our youth are telling us they're feeling a lot of pressure, that they are, you know, um, over task, um, over schedules, etc. And then another trend, which is certainly um, particularly prevalent right now is, is uncertainty. But even before the pandemic, um, our youth really um, were living in a, a very uncertain time. On the shadows of 9-11, they're growing up and fear of you know terrorism, fear from a soul or mass shooter attack and, and fear about the future of our climate. All of that are things that um, we may, many of us did not deal with growing up and are impacting our youth. So how does this all play out in, in terms of the um, pandemic and COVID-19? Um, it certainly is more complicated and everything is amplified. I will share with you that we do have a number of students um, who are who those in particular who have uh, experienced social anxiety before the pandemic who actually are doing quite well and thriving. However, um, many of our students, um, even those that were doing well academically, um, pretty self-motivated, are struggling during this time. Um, it's very difficult for them to stay motivated. Um, and I know as parents, um, you've probably seen that some of those maybe um, annoying habits, um, the defiance or refusals, fighting that you saw on occasion have become really more heightened, um, have increased. You're probably seeing that. And our teens are telling us that they are, they are very fearful. Um, they are feeling in particular very isolated. They're missing those connections um, that they had with their teachers and with their peers. Um, so we're hoping today to, to problem solve with you a bit and give you some ideas to help deal with that. Hi, my name is Julie Mosier and I'm the Student Advocate for Engagement or SAFE counselor at Eagle View Middle School and Air Academy High School. So what are we seeing and hearing in our community? I know um, Linda did touch on this just a little bit. But in elementary, and we've got the different age levels, in elementary school, we're seeing a lot of anxiety uh, with the kids, and especially when we first started coming back to school, um, they felt like they didn't want to wear their masks all day because they felt like they couldn't breathe. But um, we've really kind of tried to work through some of that, allowing kids breaks outside and taking care of some of those things. Another thing is that they're obsessively washing their hands or using hand sanitizer to the point where it gets in the way of learning. Um, we're also seeing a lot of fear with our elementary age kids. Uh, when in the middle school, they're missing a lot of those social connections and that is such a time where your friends are everything and you really want to just connect with those kids. Uh, students are struggling to keep up with the work and navigate the different learning platforms. I know that we're seeing a lot of the kids that um, they'll say, but wait, I've got straight A's and then they look at the other one and it's not as much of a pretty picture. So there's two different platforms going on and that can be a challenge, uh, really trying to navigate that and 
um, having the kids uh, do the work uh, in one place and then make sure they get it submitted in a different place. It's just really kind of been a challenge for our middle schoolers. In high school, we um, actually it was pretty impressive. We had a group of students who sent out on their own Instagram a survey to see how kids are doing with the current current crisis and the pandemic and what they felt like they needed and they were so impressed they got a lot over 100 responses and um, the kids took time they wrote paragraphs and different things and this is just a quick quote quote that we got from one of the students. Um, I feel like this increase in isolation and change to online school can increase um, the, in, the depression and anxiety among students because it can be difficult to get work done in the new environment. Our kids, especially at the high school level, are missing the collaborative work together, the support of their teachers, uh, and just working to get things done. So when should we be concerned about our students? I really want, as parents, I want you to always remember this, is that you have your own spidey sense. You know when something's not quite right with your kid. You have been with that baby for a very long time, and as they grow up, you really know that your child, and you have that sense of when something's not quite right. But there are some expected development changes, and there are some concerning development changes. And so when you see an increased desire for privacy, that's that's pretty normal um, for, for kids. But if you start seeing them um, being a little bit more secretive, that's when you need to start answering, asking some questions. My daughter, I can always tell when she's trying to be secretive because she holds her hand up. And I did ask her for permission, but she always holds her hands up and covers her phone a little bit and tilts it away from me so that she, um, she thinks that she's being uh, very secretive. But I'm on to her. So that's when you start asking those questions like, hey, what you doing? What's going on? Uh, just to make sure that they're aware that, that you kind of are noticing those things. Um, there's also um, an increase uh, in emotional intensity and mood swings, and that's pretty normal with kids as they're growing up, especially middle school and high school. Um, but the, the problem is, is if the emotional responses start to limit their ability to function and to get through things and keep those relationships going, then that's really a time where you need to look at that and explore maybe getting some support. Um, it's very normal for kids to seek new adventures and new things and try new things, but if they start doing things that are very risky um, or unhealthy, that maybe trying drugs or different substances, that's, that's kind of important to uh, be aware of that and to get some help. Um, when they begin to withdraw from family and spend more time with friends, that's that's very normal for kids right now. They, they just don't want to be around mom and dad anymore. Um, but if they start to pull those connections away from family and then also um, start pulling away from their social connections, that's a time to be a little bit concerned. And I know right now is a very difficult time um, to find that line because we are, the kids are pretty isolated. We're at home, um, we're not able to be together, but our kids are still able to connect through technology, which is a great thing. Um, it can be a struggle right now too, but. Um, and then also another thing is they start to transition away from um, their childhood pursuits to the more adolescent pursuits. Putting Barbie away, that is one of the hardest days as a mom, and we're still trying to clean out our our storage room and it just kills me. I we uh, have they're getting rid of all their little toys. It makes me sad. But if they completely lose interest in their childhood activities and they also um, don't replace those, then that's something to maybe be concerned. Start encouraging other activities or other things that they could do um, just to try to figure out some of those new interests. Um, and then. Uh, de depression and anxiety corresponds with our current circumstances and right now we are definitely in a place where we are seeing that with a lot of our students. They are uh, struggling because they're not seeing their friends, they're not at school with those connections and being able to talk to the people and just the things you see when you're in a regular, when you're just around each other more and actually I think we've seen some positive too where when you're around with your family you're getting to see a little bit more as well because they have to spend more time with your family. But uh, when it gets to be a concern about the anxiety and depression is when um, they start to having some sleep disruption. But again, we're having some issues with that because of all the technology and everybody's patterns are a little bit off. And so again, knowing your kid, using that spider sense, spidey sense and making sure that you know um, if something's going on and if your child shares any thoughts about death or suicide, please, please get help for them right away. Um, there's a lot of resources out there for that. 
another thing uh, that we wanted to share is that there there are 80 percent of teens with depression and anxiety but the, the greatest thing about that is those kids who are diagnosed with depression anxiety 80 percent of those can be successfully treated but the downside is that less than 33 percent of teens actually seek help for their depression or anxiety um, having a supportive adult and peers, and I know that since all of you are here listening to this, that means you are probably one of those supportive adults, and thank you for being here. Um, but that is such an important thing, and um, also having their peers there to help and support them as well. And we will now hear from Kristen Segrin about some more protective factors. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Kristen Segrin, another safe counselor. I serve at Mountain Ridge Middle School and Rampart High School. All right. So some questions we're going to kind of dive into with this next section is looking at protective factors and how they promote our mental health. Some ongoing strategies you guys can take tonight and go forward with your family. Um, how to practice healthy emotional skills, how we can practice mindful interaction, and um, the awesome part is developing a self-care plan for you guys to do tonight. Again, to have something in your hands that's tangible to move forward with and hopefully uh, be useful for you and your family. So Sources of Strength is a wonderful program that District 20 adopted in 2016. The most exciting part about Sources of Strength is that it was developed here locally in Denver and is now worldwide. It's an incredible program that uh, basically the way they developed this is they went out to teens facing adversity and challenges. And they said, what helps you get through this? What, what are those things that are, are helping you find resiliency in facing such hard times? And they took these eight common themes and developed what they call the source of strength wheel. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through each of one of these very briefly, but I, while we're going through this, I want you to think about for your child, what protective factors do you think they have in their life right now? And also I want you to think about what protective factors you have in your life because we model for our kids, right? So looking at the first one, we're gonna start on the orange, it's family support. So when we look at family support, it's not necessarily the family you're born into. It can also be what we call chosen family, especially being in a high military population. I know for myself as a prior military wife, uh, the military family became our chosen family. So chosen family and family support is incredibly important. The next one we look at is positive friends. So we talk to kids about understanding and recognizing characteristics and people that are positive friends for you. So those people that when you get good news, those people you wanna call up on the phone right away because you're so excited to share with them. They're the people who are uplifting to you. So it's good for you to know who your students' positive friends are and also for you as the adult who your positive friends are and what that means to you because it's very unique in what people look for. The next part of the wheel is mentors. We talk about mentors, we talk about coaching, guidance, and we always want our students to identify someone in the school and outside of the school that's a mentor for them. So it would be very good for conversation moving forward tonight is to ask your student, who is their trusted adult? Who is a mentor they look up to? Who do they feel safe with talking with in the school? And then for parents, you know, we, we forget that sometimes we need mentors as adults. Think about when you first started into your career, whether it be a professional career outside the home or even becoming a parent yourself inside the home and, and what that meant and who you went to for guidance and for those, um, those tough questions to kind of help lead you through that. So mentors is incredibly important. Next, we go into healthy activities. And healthy activities, um, we want to look at, you know, what gives you energy, right? So when we talk to the kids, oftentimes kids immediately think of sports, which is great. Sports can be a great one, but we also want to recognize that there can be other way of doing healthy activities such as singing, uh, writing poetry, writing horses, dancing, all sorts of things. So healthy activities is whatever feeds your positive energy. Next, we go into generosity. We know that doing good for others makes us feel good. So just a simple ra random act of kindness, which is very popular right now. Uh, it's for adults, I feel like it's almost sometimes easier. You can pick up the person's coffee behind you in Starbucks line, but it doesn't have to be necessarily tied to spending money. It can be giving your time, um, helping a neighbor out, helping out a friend, 
we have several students share that they sometimes babysit siblings and we talk to them. That's generosity. Giving your time to your family to help be supportive, which is incredibly important. The next one we look at is spirituality, and that root word is spirit. Oftentimes our immediate thought we go to is organized religion and church, and our faith community is huge. And for many people, that is really important, and that's fantastic if that's what it is for you. But we want to recognize for people that maybe don't attend church, what is it that fills your spirit? So that could be yoga, meditation, simply watching a sunrise or a sunset. Um, we talk about with the kids too, just recognizing gratitude, right? And being grateful for things, how that can fill our spirits. Um, Sources of Strength did an incredible study where they took several individuals, did brain scans on them, and then challenged them for 21 days to write down three things, three things that you're grateful for. And in those really hard days, it can be as simple as shoes to wear on my feet, and sunshine outside, right? Um, then they rescan those brains at the end of the 21 days, and it was incredible because literally there was a change in the brain, right? So we know the science backs that gratitude. So another thing to kind of think about and put in your back pocket moving forward is, could your family do a gratitude journal? When we start to pay attention to the positive things around us, we recognize it more easily. I kind of think about when uh, you're gonna go buy a new car, like let's say you're gonna go buy a, a truck, right? All of a sudden you see trucks everywhere on the road, right? So recognizing what's positive for you, what are things you're grateful for, and that just really can start to manifest much more in your life, which is amazing. The next two parts are medical access and mental health, which we kind of group together. So we look at medical access. We talk about physical health and recognize the importance of how our physical health and our mental health are completely intertwined. We know that sometimes when we get nervous or experience anxiety, we might get like butterflies in our stomach, kind of like how all of us as presenters probably felt a little bit tonight getting on for you guys. Um, but we, we also want to recognize that when we're having things like we can't sleep or we can't function, we get that paralyzing anxiety and, and depression. That's when it's time to really recognize, again, that mental health piece of when it's time to go to the doctor, when it's time to connect to a professional. So understanding what your medical access is and the importance of recognizing that connection between physical health and mental health. So with this wheel all together, we know and recognize and want to highlight for you guys that the more you have of these, the more equipped you are to deal with those challenges, those adversities. And we also know that this is a very fluid wheel. Some weeks you might be incredibly strong with generosity because you're able to participate maybe in some volunteering. The next week, uh, it might be healthy activities. Let's say you get an injury though and sprang an ankle. All of a sudden you can't do the things you were normally doing. So it's very fluid in how it moves. And so understanding that maybe what you're strong in and kind of thinking about again, like I posed in the very beginning, where you're really strong in those um, sources of strength for you right now and where you could maybe beef it up a little bit. So whether that be mentors and reaching out to someone again um, earlier in your career uh, or just connecting with positive friends in your life. So we look at healthy coping strategies for youth. Um, we just wanted to highlight again um, the importance of finding common ground, okay? So some individual examples you can kind of see on the left and some family examples might be some things you could do on the right. So we want to remind you as parents what we think is fantastic and a great idea, our, our kids may not, right? And what our kids think are awesome, we may kind of like, oh, not really for us, right? So it's again, finding negotiations and way to compromise on how you can just really, again, spend intentional time. We always encourage um, many families to maybe get a bowl and sit down and just randomly through the week, write down some ideas and put them in the bowl. And when you have even 30 minutes in a week where everyone in your household has a little bit of free time, being intentional, picking something from that bowl and just having a good time together and really spending intentional time and quality time and listening and having a chance to express yourself as well. So we just wanna encourage you to do that as much as possible. So again, we really wanna challenge you to think about where you are. This is an example of what someone 
might look like with their own strength wheel. So this person um, might have extremely positive friends. Um, this might look like an adolescent, how we know their teens peers are most important to them. Um, we also are seeing, like someone mentioned earlier, that family support is actually really big right now with kids because you're spending more time together, um, which I think is a positive to come out of all of this. But again, looking at where you could maybe strengthen your own wheel and what that might look like. OK, we're going to have a, a challenge here. So this is really exciting. Um, bear with us. This is something new we're going to try. What we find is that parents really want to hear from each other and we want to hear from you. So we're going to put a um, link in the chat and this is to um, pull everywhere. And what I would like you to do is share which of the sources of strength that you feel you're really getting the most support from right now. So fingers crossed, everybody. And we'll see if it works. All right. And we want show responses. All right, fantastic. Okay. So looking at this and there we see it moving a little bit. We see family support is where a lot of people are leaning into, which is amazing. And I love, love, love. Look at that healthy activities popping up. Yes, that's amazing. So I love to see that because we are so blessed and lucky to live in a beautiful place like Colorado and have the access to mountains and such. And so doing hikes and things like that might be one way that some of you are really experiencing healthy activities. I love that we got a lot. I see that maybe mentors and generosity is a place that a lot of people could maybe improve upon. So that's fantastic. Thank you guys so much for participating. I really love seeing that. You can see it popping around and see what your peers are peers are kind of thinking. All right. Bear with me and we'll get back. All right, we good to move forward? Awesome. OK, I'm going to hand it over to Clark Maxson, so bear with us while we switch over to him. And thank you guys so much for being here again. Well, hi, my name is Clark Maxson, and um, I have um, I was used to be uh, the teacher in the district. I taught at Rampart for a few years. And so I, I got to spend a lot of time with uh, students altogether, 21 years as, as a teacher and a, and a few as an, an administrator. So I really got a chance to, to hear a lot from teachers uh, or, and, from, and from kids. So uh, Chris, if you could uh, advance this a little bit. So th what this is all about, this first part is, you know, we're thinking about what can we do as families? And as Kristen mentioned, we have more, the kids, our kids are relying on family support more than probably any time in, in our recent history. And the kids are even telling us this, even our adolescent kids are telling us this. And so we know that this is, it's a, it's a challenging time in many ways, but it also is a time with some great opportunities. So what's going on in the home is really important. We see it has a big impact on on mental health for kids. So a couple of things we're going to kind of look at in general are um, just modeling for our kids, being healthy ourselves as adults, and also working to provide the environment that is really conducive to uh, good mental health for, for everyone. And so some of the things we're going to be kind of talking about are a little bit analogous to that whole oxygen mask uh, in the airplane so that when Pre-flight, they say loss of cabin pressure, put your own mask on first and then put your mask on anybody you need to assist. And so it's really important for us as the adults to be in the best uh, best place that we can. So as we're just kind of looking at this list, setting clear boundaries and a couple of things I would say about that is um, one, one of the things I'm doing now is I'm counseling and so I have a, a, a lot of clients and as I'm helping my clients learn how to set boundaries, sometimes they think it has to be done with, with a frowning face and yelling. 
And uh, and so I think that's a great example of establishing boundaries with a friendly voice and a calm attitude. This next one, conflicts. Um, anybody had any conflicts in their homes in the last few months? Yeah, I think probably a few of us had. Um, and, and the hard part about this is it's, this one says do this intelligently. And one of the things that happens is when our fight, flight, freeze, our survival brain, our stress brain starts kicking in, then one of the things that happens is our medial prefrontal cortex, that's kind of right behind our skull here, the part that helps us to make good decisions, well, that one actually starts shutting down. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you start getting elevated in terms of your stress and then maybe you said something that you kind of regret later. It's just how people are. So we have to really think about timing and, con and, and context on all of these things. That, this next one I think is really important too, celebrating individual accomplishments. And that's so much around context and, and time and individuals. So what might have been what might have been just routine a few months ago now might be a cause for, you know, to celebrate success like, wow, you got up before noon three days in a row and that might be success for someone. So um, just to be kind of noticing that what what success looks like might be a little different depending upon the context. Um, and this next one, functioning as a team. Gosh, what a great way to think about a family. I think when our family is doing the best, that's what we're doing. We're kind of supporting each other, rooting for each other, and uh, and kind of moving forward together. Um, I think the last couple are really important too. There is so much um, that is in our control and so much that's outside of our control. And accepting reality doesn't mean that I want to stay there, but just acknowledging. And I think this is really important, for, especially for adults. For, for you who are tuning in, you often want to just manage it all, and that's, that's fantastic. But there are some things that you just uh, can't control, but we just have to accept this is what, this is what COVID is like right now. This is what, um, what isolation and quarantine is. So if you kind of think about your own home, Think about just for a moment, which of these comes more easily in your own home and which of these are more difficult? And you'll probably notice that some are more easily managed in your home and some uh, might be a little more challenging. So next slide, please. So what I, what I kind of like about this one is this one is is really about some of those kind of conversations that you can have with with uh, with your kids. Some of the things that we're finding through research is kids listen to their parents. And sometimes they do it with eye roll or sometimes they do it with a shrug, but we know that they hear everything that you say and they really take those those words to heart. And I, and I, I really learned this when I was teaching and I'll never forget, I was, uh, as I was teaching, we, I was help facilitating a support group for some kids and this one, um, this one, girl said to me, she said, my parents let me do whatever I, I want to do. And they let me stay out till midnight. They didn't even ask any questions. So the next night I stayed out till two. And they let me stay out again. And then the next night I just stayed out all night. And she said, I wish they would have sat me down and just talked to me about it. Even if I was mad, I would have would have appreciated that. And so sometimes our our, our kids want us to talk to them even though we may not really see that in so a few things are i think are really important about these conversations is it's important that these conversations really really respect them they have great ideas and to, for you to be patient and listen and understand that some of the things that might be coming uh, but that they might be saying might come out of frustration but to be patient with them. But you might notice that they there's a lot of things that they really do like to talk about and they'd like you to learn about. And their friends are important to them. So talking about friends, and that kind of helps you to find common goals as a family and common values as a family. And how you make decisions. And, and share that, share how you make decisions. Um, let the kids, let your kids know that you have you have challenges too, and you're working through challenges. And how do you make decisions in those times are great ways to model that sort of openness. 
Uh, and next, next slide. So spending time together, as 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 we all have seen, and well, at least for a lot of us, we have more time together than we when we have for a long time, and and so so there is opportunity here, and there's a possibility for challenges. We're all together, and we can't escape each other sometimes. So some of this is going to be really looking at appropriate boundaries, giving people space, but also engaging uh, together. And so these are just some exact examples of activities. Some of the things I think are, are really important about this are to be interested and take an interest in what your kids are interested in. Here's just an example. Um, I have a, a one of my one of my kids when he was a teenager was into video games. Uh, anybody out there have a kid into video games? Probably a couple. And and it seemed like he would just disappear. So. I started asking him about the video game and, and he was willing to tell me a little bit. And then I said, hey, hey, could you teach me how to play it? And so he played it and we were on two separate computers and we had this program called Discord where we could talk. And I was kind of doing what he and his friends did, except I was doing it very poorly. And um, and he thought that was hilarious um, how quickly I got uh, out of the game. But it was something we could talk about and, and, it, and it really was kind of a kick. Um, it also made it more, it made it easier for him to then kind of reciprocate and get interested in something I was doing. So those are possibilities. There's, I think, some fun things on this list. I especially like that last one. I've seen these recreating old, old family photos, recreate a childhood photo and you do it with adults or even something from a movie. And so um, other things on here is, is finding out what people enjoy, what, find out what your kids enjoy and meet them in that space. Um, I found with one of my kids that I wanted to have a conversation across the table with a meal and never got any more than one or two words. It was like it was like pulling teeth to get any words. But then I discovered that if we took a drive together, oh, she would start talking and, and we would go for longer drives and we would talk more. And that never would have occurred to me if, if I hadn't I just actually came across it by chance. But sometimes you have to experiment. I think all of us need to experiment a little bit. Well, I think, um, Kristen, we've got another uh, poll everywhere. So what, just like last time, we would love to hear from you about what's an activity that brings your family closer together. And I'm sure you are very curious about what all of those creative and brilliant parents out there tonight are thinking. So let's find out a few of the things. So what is one of those activities that you have found um, helps bring you closer together? And so I think you can find that up on a response. So just as you're ready, type one in. So these are these are fun to watch these come in, aren't they? So uh, all kinds of interesting things. Um, so oh, Zoom video or Zoom games. I've heard of that. And you get the piece is always helpful. I see movies come up a few different times. Board games. Now that 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 could be a lot of fun. We we sometimes get to those fishing. Fantastic family walks or hikes. It sounds like yeah, watching. TV, playing board games, doing activities, game nights. Looks like game nights have come up and games have, have come up quite a few times here, spending time outdoors. I've seen camping come up a couple of times. So yeah, games and watching movies. Movies are big ones. And uh, I think sometimes with movies, it's especially important to, to allow various people to pick, pick the movies. And family dinner, dinners are, are great times. So new crafts, wood burning, nice. watching movies. 
Yeah, so walking a lot of times um, is a great way to, to have hard conversations and and hiking, <laughs> cooking, only dessert. Yeah. All right. So we might looks like those are kind of slowing down there. So hey, thank you for for putting those in and sharing those um, with uh, with other parents. It's kind of inspiring, especially especially to see something new, and it's also inspiring when we get to see um, when we get to see that other people are doing some of the things that we are as well. So, so this next part um, really gets to, I think, coming back to that place. So we're talking about anxiety and depression. So those are definitely emotional, uh, emotional uh, pieces here. And, and we're, what we're thinking about in this whole thing tonight is understanding certainly the adolescents and they're going through a developmental period. But I think it's super important for us to remember that we as adults are also going through uh, a developmental period. It, and part of our developmental period is we're moving from our life before to our life during the COVID time to what, what is coming next. And so once again, being able to put that oxygen mask on yourself, your emotional oxy, oxygen mask on first before uh, you're able to help the emotions of others. So we all need to be practicing these, these skills and modeling them together. So uh, Christine, could you uh, advance some of these? Yeah, so here's just some examples. And you'll notice when we're talking about emotional skills, the first and most important is to accept our emotions and to accept the emotions of our of our kids. Emotions are, ne emotions are never the problem. Sometimes behaviors can be the problem, but emotions really are like good friends. And sometimes good friends tell us things that uh, we don't want to hear, but we need to hear. Well, that's what emotions do for us too. So just being accepting of and aware of those emotions to experience those emotions rather than avoid them. And, and there's a lot of great research that these are skills that actually make a difference in people's emotional and mental health. Acceptance of and empathy for emotional concerns and issues. You know, I, this comes up a lot sometimes with uh, adolescents and they make you know, one of your adolescents may come home and say, this has been the very worst day of my life. And you might be thinking, wow, it's going to get a lot worse than that. But remember, they have they haven't had as many as many trials and crises as we have. And so for them, this really, truly might be the very worst day of their life. And it's important for us, I think, to really listen to that that heart and have empathy for that. Another thing I think is really important is that we disclose our emotions, that we we are we are genuine with our own emotions. So, for example, one of the things I used to try to hide those from my kids, but I found out later they always knew. <laughs> so, that, you know, if I was mad, they might say, are you OK, Dad? And I say, I'm fine. And but they knew. So if I so what I taught them, unfortunately, inadvertently, is I taught them, oh, we don't talk about emotions in our family. And, that wasn't what I meant. I thought I was being strong for everybody. It, it turned out that that as I as I got a little bit more aware and I was able to say, yeah, I'm, I'm a little angry right now. And this is this is why. And this is what I think I'm going to do. You know, maybe it's I'm going to go take a nap or I'm going to go for a run or or whatever it was. And then I, they could they could see me sharing and processing an emotion and even giving a potential solution. So how does your family deal with emotions? Well, if there's a lot of us who grew up in families that didn't deal with emotions, who whose parents grew up in families that didn't deal with emotions, whose grandparents grew up in families that didn't deal with emotions. So a lot of this is is the modeling that we're used to. And so I think for for a lot of us, it's a journey toward mental health. And that journey toward mental health, I think, is going to be in part just really getting better with some of these emotional skills. So think about, are there some ways that you would like to deal with emotions differently in your family and maybe kind of change that progression of, of history? So some 
I think important to think about. So uh, next next slide. And, and, and I think a lot for a lot of a lot of people, um, even just to be able to talk about emotions is is a new is a new level of skill and, and just and just unfamiliar. Um, one of the classes I used to teach in high school was called ESL, and that was English as a second language. And I started using ESL for um, for a lot of a lot of the people that I know um, that is emotions as a second language. So it looks like we're. Right. So so this this is kind of a summary of some ways to have mindful interactions, mindful parenting. And so if you look on the left hand side, this is the way that I was kind of raised. And this is probably how I started off as a parent in many cases. And I wanted to have all the answers for my kids. I, I wanted to be able to tell them what was good, what was bad. Um, I rejected my emotions and ignored them because I wanted to be strong for everybody else. I thought that was strong. Um, I, I sometimes would deny or minimize challenges, say, oh, that's not that big a deal. You know, we'll get through this, we'll get over it. Um, really wanting to control outcomes and thinking that if I just was a, if I was just the perfect parent, then my kids would be just perfect and everything would be perfect. And as I started to, to, to get to know my kids better as they got older, I realized that that really wasn't an attainable goal. Uh, perfection in parenting actually doesn't happen. Another thing I think that I've just sometimes done is focused a bit on the negative. And this last one passed you know, focus on past and future. Um, occasionally, I don't know if you've had this experience, if that I have gotten halfway through a meal that I was eating and forgot that I'd even been eating and didn't even notice the flavor. Or maybe one of my kids had come to me and I was busy worrying about tomorrow and they said something to me and I didn't think to look up, put my stuff down and talk to them. So those are some things that just, just confessions here. This is kind of how I was raised and this is sort of how I started. And so the direction that I'm moving toward and the direction that our that research tells us really ends up having better outcomes for kids and mental health for all of us is really to be, you know, instead of having the answers, being open, open to learning. Um, your kids will really appreciate that. Um, also, it, it's rarely all or nothing. We, we sometimes see that all or nothing polarized thinking, but so often it's more complex. Um, people used to ask me, well, is social media the reason why kids are having anxiety and depression? And I would say, well, that's a piece of the puzzle is much more complicated. And I think sometimes it takes courage to, to go for, to understand the complexity. And another one um, is instead of judging, is being curious. And that, that applies to our kids and ourselves. Um, anybody out there sometimes kind of beat yourself up, like, oh shoot, I should have done better. Well, that's an opportunity instead of judging yourself, maybe to be curious, like, huh, I wonder why that happened or what would be a different way and just kind of take that science approach. Um, staying, uh, staying aware of emotions, talking about those, being accepting of challenges, being transparent and open about these kinds of things. Um, and, and I think another one that, you know, we, we certainly believe in unconditional love. But sometimes our, I think our kids can get the message that they're OK if they're achieving and they're OK if they're performing well. And even if that message isn't coming from you, it's coming from the world around them. And so we've got to we've got to work really hard to let them know that they are loved and accepted just how they are for who they are. Um, I think another one I told you a little bit about my experience driving with my daughter, but the this idea of finding different ways to connect and just experimenting, being open, seeing what interests our kids. Um, the second to the last one here on, on the right, acknowledging mistakes. That one has been especially difficult for me. And I've found that when I've done that genuinely, um, it's always been received with grace from my kids. Like um, and 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 I think they really appreciated it. So 
a hard thing to do is say, you know, your dad just made a big mistake here. I, I really, I really want to do it differently next time. So as you look through this, a whole bunch there, tons and tons to focus on, but maybe there was something that kind of stood out for you there. And maybe it was something that you see as a challenge, like, yeah, that's something that I want to do. Maybe I want to stay more aware of emotions. Maybe I want to be more in the moment. Um, whatever that might be, we're going to ask one more time for you to just let us know what's standing out for you. I think it's really, I think it'd be really interesting uh, to hear. We've got a lot of different folks up there tonight and we've got a big variety of people, I'm sure, with all kinds of uh, different challenges. So oh, we got the end of uh, some of those activities. I saw, um, yeah, that, oh, they're coming in already. Yeah. So yeah, we'll just kind of take a take a moment to to type some things in. Is that Clark is very handsome? That's a scary one. Uh, accepting and being open to learning. Um, I I want to be less judgmental. Of thinking of new ways to connect. Yeah, maybe it's taking a drive. I want to be more aware of my emotions. You know, I, that, that one takes a lot of courage. Practicing gratitude. Uh, I love that one. A lot of good research around that. Plus, it's just good work. Um, yeah, I see that one. Um, a lot of students are having some trouble right now. And being empathetic with your kids and, and helping support them is, is really is really important. Focusing on the present, uh, that seems like a lifelong goal for me too. Being curious, um, valuable time, finding ways to do that. Unconditional love, can't go wrong with that. Yeah, good good point. Positivity, we are teaching res resilience. There's opportunities abound for resilience. Um, And, you know, and, and there's this one about sucking as a parent. I just want to address that one in this way is every one of us could could find ways that we could think, oh, I, I could improve. And and the thing is, um, I know something about you as a parent because you're here tuning in tonight. And I think sometimes good enough parenting is what we really need and to be transparent and open uh, and curious and mindfulness. Unconditional love is coming up. Uh, unprecedented for sure and helping helping kids in a realistic way those are some uh, really fabulous uh, reflections there um, so now we're going to turn uh, our attention for just a few minutes on a self-care plan for periods of high stress and so i think that you may have this document and so what i'd like you to do is th these are this one is for me and what we say a lot of times is the time to practice getting out of a building that's on fire is when the building is not on fire. That's a fire drill. And so this is preparing in advance for a time that could be high stress. So the first thing is just being aware, am I going into a period of high stress? And some of the ways you're going to recognize that is maybe for me, it's like I got racing thoughts. Maybe I've got some muscle tension. Um, maybe my heart feels like it's pounding a little bit. Maybe I get some stomach discomfort and it tells me that my stress level is coming up. So that's really important for me. It's nice to have this thought out ahead of time so that when I see something like that, I can say, oh yeah, I know what this is. This is useful information. So, uh, so think about what that might be for you and maybe jot down a couple of those for yourself. What, is the, what are those warning signs? And uh, next, next slide, Kristen. So, Internal coping mechanisms. These are really good to, to think of in advance because I don't know about you, but sometimes when I've been upset, I can't think in the moment of anything to do. We know our brains are actually, our cognitive brains aren't working as well. So if we can think plan in advance, that's going to be really helpful. So what are some strategies? Like, well, these are some things that help me. Um, if I, I may not think of it at the time, but if I do remember to go for a walk, 
things just start to look a little bit better. Or strenuous exercise, working on a project, maybe some uh, breathing, some uh, mindful breathing. But for you, those could be totally different. And so it might, it, it, why don't you jot down a couple of those? Also be thinking, wouldn't this be something that might be potentially a great thing to do with your kids? Maybe even sit down together. Hey, hey, let's let's get a self care plan, and and or they might want to keep it private. And of course, if they do, you know that's that's up to them. But it's really helpful for kids to have these plans in advance, and they run the range from a really stressful day all the way up to we're moving toward crisis, so that this self care plan can really be used in a really wide range. Uh, next next slide, please. So an, another one of these things, think about in advance, this could really be helpful. So people and settings that help kind of just distract you, kind of move your mind away from whatever it is that's really a cause of some distress. So I've got a couple of good friends that I, that I can call and, um, and I got their names up there. So if they're listening tonight, you guys, good friends. Um, then a place to go. If I go to my garage, I always get distracted. Often I'll get lost. Um, but there's always something to do in there. So I will get distracted there. A another thing is uh, cycling. I just love love my bikes and love riding. So that'll take my mind off the distressful stuff. So and next. Yeah, who who are some people I can ask for help? So my wife and my sister and another uh, really good friend are people that if I really need some help. And once again, it, this is important for kids to be able to do and especially to do it in a time when they're not in crisis. That is a time when they're calm so that they can really think about who are those positive uh, friends or who and, and perhaps it's family members, but don't feel bad if it isn't you. They may have another trusted adult in their life. Um, so so for them to have those people and to think about them in advance so that they will know when um, when it's when it's time to ask for help that they can do that. So all, all together, this is kind of this um, this self care plan. So we've talked a bit about uh, gratitude and how just how powerful that is and and to put together a list. So for me, it's my 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 family, my wife and my kids. I, I can do meaningful work. I, I have relationships with people in my work and personal lives. These are things I'm grateful for. If I'm in a really kind of a dark mood or a dark place or a distressful time, I might be, not be able to think of a single thing I'm grateful for, but I might be able to pick up this list and read it and maybe read it over and over again until I actually believe it. And so that's the value of having a, having a plan in advance. So there's also prevention. So we kind of looked at what's, what about during stressful times, but even before we get to the stressful times, if we can keep our overall level of stress down, if we can keep our level of positive emotions and joy up, it gives us a lot more coping room. So if our level of stress is already up here, we only got a little ways to go before we blow our top. But if, if our stress level is down low, then we've got a lot of room where we can, um, we can where we can cope and kind of we sometimes call that the coping window. So we want to make that coping window as big as possible for ourselves, for our kids, for our family. And so a lot of this is being real intentional. What are some things that I can do um, to bring joy in my life? Well, for me, it's connecting with people. Um, and who am I going to play with? Um, we as adults need to play, too. I'm on a bike racing team, so I go I got I to go play with my bike racing team and race my bike. Um, what do I do to help keep myself strong? regular exercise, healthy diet, meditation are some examples of some things that work for me. You need to be kind of thinking about, well, what, 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 are, those, what are those things for you? What are those things for your kid? And it might even be hard for them to kind of identify. So sometimes it might be, you might need to help them a little bit. Like, hey, I noticed that when you bake cookies, you always seem so happy after that. Seems like you love baking cookies. Um, and then uh, what about nurturing creativity? Creativity is so powerful and important for us. So for nurturing uh, creativity, um, I'm gonna, I've just started working on a YouTube channel called Better Mental Health. I'll let you know when it's up and live. I think it might be good. 
my mom said she would watch. So, so everybody will have some things that will spark their creativity. Maybe it's writing poems or journaling or drawing. And I think it's super important that we don't think we have to be great at this creative, creative endeavor. Because if we have to be great at it, now it's a stress producing thing. So something that you can just be you and express yourself with. So there is kind of a well-rounded uh, self-care plan. You have those, those documents and I just really encourage you to, um, to, to plan that out. You notice as we talk through it, it just took a few minutes. And as you and your family uh, might do that, and that might even be an activity uh, with pizza, maybe dessert, who knows, you know your family. So I think that's, there we are. So I think what's coming up next, um, we're gonna have a, a little period of question and answers. And uh, I think I'm turning this over to Martha. Thank you, Clark. We are going to go through the questions that have been asked uh, and try to get through as many as we can before our time is over tonight. First question uh, is, how are you seeing anxiety with the schools closed? Yeah. Or you can speak on that and yeah. others yeah. may want to. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I can, I, um, generally significant increase and from multiple sources. So in the in the counseling agency where I'm interning, a lot more um, a lot more cases of anxiety are coming to us. Uh, kids who had pre-existing anxiety, we've seen those elevating. We've also seen the anxiety of their parents elevating a lot with school closures. Um, I and I also um, get to work with a lot of school counselors. And I think across the board universally, uh, my school counselor friends are telling us that uh, levels, of levels of anxiety are up and numbers of cases of anxiety are up. Both of those things are true and happening. Okay, I just wanna add on to what Clark said. We are definitely, as being in the school setting, um, right now, we are definitely seeing an increase in anxiety because this is obviously a time that no one was prepared for and the best we're doing is finding our resiliency along that way, right? So I would say yes, we are definitely seeing anxieties increase and I think um, really being mindful in your home of what you are paying attention to and even those discussions you're having um, as adults whether or not you want the student to be part of that um, depending on age depending on maturity just be very mindful again of conversations because sometimes the processing with uh, with logical understanding it can be difficult for students to understand everything and so we don't want to create or add to any more anxiety so just trying to find ways to um, definitely give space and safe space for conversations and for them to express that, but also matching that with what can we do to help get you through this anxiety, right? We don't want that paralyzing anxiety, but what kind of strengths can we lean into and what kind of resources do we need to have in order to get through this together as a family? Next question. When does, when should we be concerned about our youth? Um, with children who are autistic, what should we look out for to be concerned? Um, would you like me to go ahead? Um, so uh, definitely children diagnosed with autism. Um, we know that the the literal thinking they sometimes have in very uh, linear thinking can be a strength in a way because this can be a way that you can present um, the information that's received. So I would definitely reach out to who your resources are, um, whether that be uh, a, a family physician or whether they're seeing an outside community therapist or whether they do some sort of Zoom, um, provide su support groups for children with autism. So I think it would be really uh, beneficial for anyone with students with special needs to 
reach out to other people in the community. We know that our SPED department does a fantastic job. Um, I know specifically both at Mountain Ridge I can speak to and Rampart have a phenomenal SPED department that has access to, to so many resources and sometimes we just don't know what's out there, right? So definitely if you're having any question, I would reach out to those individuals of the buildings you're in because those are your people, those are your connectors. Connect with them and have them um, make sure and give you appropriate responses for your students. Um, we know that's a spectrum with autism, so where they're at on the spectrum, so it can be an appropriate response and you can best serve them to kind of alleviate some of that stress. Next question. My child is four and with what the doctor believes is anxiety, how would you recommend supporting such a young child? And are there different signs that we should look out for? OK, I'm going to let Julie come on over. So just give me one second. Um, with anxiety in uh, children, it can present itself um, as young as four, and that can really be a challenge. Um, and I really think that one of the best things to do is to have that awareness um, and to be um, to have the set parameters for your child. You need to have the um, acknowledge that the anxiety is not necessarily rational and sometimes when we um, feed the anxiety it can grow right and then because we enable it and we allow it to continue. Uh, so so it's at four when the child it's beginning to impact their ability to do things um, go to school, if uh, they won't use a public toilet to the point where you have to, um, they're having accidents and those kind of things, that's where it's starting to impact their living and their functioning. So that is where you would need to go get some help. But some of the things that you can do with uh, kids with anxiety, one of the things is reassure, reassure them regularly, um, have that consistent uh, structure, and then also pre-teach. So if you know you're going somewhere, let them know what's going on, what's going to happen, and um, what we're going to be doing. And then when you're done, remind them and celebrate that success. And sometimes uh, if your child's scared to do something, depending on the level of anxiety around that, Sometimes doing that activity with them can help to reduce that anxiety as well. And then celebrate, celebrate, celebrate when they're able to push past that and move forward. Okay, thank you. Next question is how do I connect my child to a mentor? Do you want to take that? Yeah. I'm so happy someone asked that question with uh, the sources of strength and the importance of mentors. So depending on this, the student's age, I would definitely have a conversation. Um, that's that's for that open uh, openness to talk about who are some adults that you feel comfortable with? Uh, so this could be anyone from starting with school staff. So which teacher is your favorite? And then maybe ask what makes that teacher their favorite? That'll help you identify for your for your child what qualities they look for and what they're attracted to in a trusted adult, whether it's a uh, sense of humor or uh, authenticity, trustworthiness. Um, this could be anyone that could be a coach. This could be a neighbor. This could be someone like a pastor in a faith community, um, youth group leaders. I would also look at your 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 students um, friends parents because oftentimes we will see that they will feel very comfortable with best friends mom and dad so that would be a trusted adult so really just again having that open conversation depending on age but those are some ideas of starting maybe start with the school and then if they have any extracurricular talk about who those adults are in there and that might be an idea on how to connect them to a mentor Next question is why are we burdening our children with so much homework? They are on screen eight hours and then doing four hours of homework. That's a great question. Julie's going to take that one. That is a really, really good question. And one of the things that I know, um, I'm not sure what child the that they attend, but the, the important thing when we're dealing with screen time and things like this is that they do need the breaks and to hear that your child is doing that much additional homework above and beyond after eight hours on the computer. That's um, that is 
troubling a little bit. I think one of the things I would do is contact the email the teachers um, and work with your school directly because I know um, from my experience at Air Academy, we have been working very closely with families and when parents are sharing stories such as this to us and we're aware of it, then we're able to make some changes and make some adjustments because you are absolutely right. 12 hours is way too long for a child to be sitting in front of a screen. Um, and the important thing is throughout the day as well, the kids get breaks and um, encourage them to step outside during that time to get away from that screen for a little bit. Uh, the other challenge we have um, with kids is that then um, they have their phones and a lot of times on breaks, that's what they're doing is playing with their phones. And so that adds to that time. So I would just really encourage communicate with your school, communicate with the teachers and make sure that we're that the building is aware that this is going on and that you're getting that much homework because you are absolutely correct that that is not um, going to help a child to succeed. Next question, Julie, is someone in my daughter's class said that they wanted to complete suicide. What should I do? Um, well, the first thing that I would do is you need to uh, make sure that contact parents of the child. If you're aware of the, if your daughter knows that family, if not immediately call the school um, and talk to a counselor and file a report. If it's after hours, then I would call safe to, or you can, I would log on and file a report with safe to tell. It's a fully anonymous um, website where uh, they do not know that you reported it. Uh, but they do immediately act on that and that's with any safety issue with your children. If a child's being bullied, if a child is struggling um, with um, other safety issues, then they will take care of it and they take it seriously. It is an organization that has um, is very well regarded and that is how you get that support for those kids. Um, if it's a child within your family, you need to make sure that you um, get them assessed right away and make sure that you uh, take care of the child and take care and get help right away. That's the biggest thing. We have to talk about it and we have to get support. Clark, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no. OK, and um, Julie, can you just share that? So please go to um, our mental health. Yes, so and the, the other piece again, um, like we said, someone had said what the question Martha had said was that someone said that within their class, um, a child had said that they wanted to um, to die by suicide or they had made a threat of that. The important thing is, is to get the mental health providers in the building involved right away. Our schools need to know. We can't help what we don't know. Um, and so it's so important that we get um, help for kids right away, right away. Um, and your mental health people in your building can help with that. Next question. And Clark and Julie, you may both be able to answer this. It seems that many mental health providers are at capacity. Do you know of any practices that are taking new patients for those of us who feel like our child should be seeing someone? I, I, um, I could jump in on that one. Sure. Um, yeah, so there's um, I know that I work at a practice that is fairly large um, and it's true that many of the counselors um, have full caseloads, but there still are there still are several and and um, I just want to plug interns as well. So uh, there's some really good interns um, at at some of these agencies, so I wouldn't I wouldn't shy away from those and sometimes they're they could be really helpful as well. Um, the, the agency that I'm working at right now is Mayfield Counseling Agency, and I know that there's at least um, a few of the counselors who have a couple slots each, so. Right, and um, I also, uh, we also, ThriveWorks Counseling is another place in town that mm -hmm. does a lot. I do work part-time there, um, and I'm not <laughs> trying to plug them, but I just know that they're a large practice that takes, um, that works with a lot of different children. Um, there are, um, 
I'm going to look. There's several others that I my mind is not there right now. Um, and all of your counselors within your building have a list of therapists and referrals with um, in the community. Uh, it's a pretty extensive list, and so um, there are a lot of options out there. Uh, and and know that counselors, uh, there's a lot of counselors out there too. And so make sure that when you find a counselor for your family, if it doesn't fit your family, it's okay to go somewhere else because it's got to be, if it's going to be an effective counseling um, at all, it's you need to make sure that that person fits your family. Also, I have just put in the chat a link to the ASD 20 mental health page, which has a ton of resources where you can be directed to um, facilities as well as practices and counselors. Next question, do any of these presenters have children of school age? Do any of these presenters understand that remote learning is a disaster? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I have a middle schooler at Eagle View Middle School, and I also have a daughter who is a junior at uh, Air Academy High School. And absolutely, I agree, um, it is a challenge. Both of my children are doing okay, though, because um, they're ones that don't like the, they don't like to be around a whole lot of people, right? And so, uh, they're actually thriving in the environment. And that's one thing that I know uh, Ms. Powell touched on earlier is that some kids who struggle with social anxiety are actually thriving. Um, and so it's not a complete failure all the way around, but I do know because of the kids that I work with every day, there are struggles and kids are having a hard time. And I just want to please restate this, that we are working nonstop for these kids uh trying we're sending out we're working i know at air academy we are working uh, non-stop setting up new contracts for kids working on grades working on schedules to see what things we can do differently how we can support these things these kids differently we have made a lot of different accommodations um, for children um, please know that we are working really hard and we understand we are working with the parameters that we are given um, by the health department and by our district leaders. That's what we're working with. And it is, yes, it's challenging. It is so hard for us as counselors uh, because we know that we need, we like to see our kids every day. We do. Um, and I'll admit the other day I woke up and um, was starting in a meeting and we were, everybody was asking how we're doing. And I just broke down because these babies need they need school, some of them, you know, and some of them are doing fine, but we um, are going to have to get through this. We don't have a choice. This is where we're at right now. We are doing everything we can to make this a success and it's it's going to it's not going to be perfect. And and that's one of the biggest things I had a parent the other day that said, you know, we used to be parents that in, insisted on A's and B's and now we're just saying, you know what, do your best and it's OK. And, and, and I think that that's one of the best lessons for this. I think everyone, I know everyone in the schools is doing their best and no, it's not perfect, but we are doing our best and we are trying to support these kids and make sure that they are able to learn and grow and um, get through these, these times that are challenging, they are unprecedented, and we are, tr we are truly doing our best to help support your kids. That's why we're doing these parent nights. We are starting some new um, groups and your school should have one soon that we're gonna do some small groups with parents where it's gonna just be an opportunity um, with a couple of mental health providers to sit and talk and work through some of these things that we're struggling with at home. Uh, the district is doing a lot of things that we're really trying to help support families and kids and meet your needs uh, the best that we can. And no, like I said, it is not perfect. But if you can communicate with your school, let them know what the major issue is, that is going to help make the difference. Next question. How do we motivate our children who suffer from anxiety and depression to do their homework and other miscellaneous assignments? I find that our children are getting discouraged and can lose motivation and have outbursts. I have a great one of the what well, someone told me this solution the other day and it was a really neat trick. Um, you get post-it notes 
cut them in half or you can get the small ones too. Look at your assignments and however many assignments you have, maybe pick two or three, depending on your student, it could be one and say, OK, when you complete that assignment, will depending on the age of your child, like my family, we used to play tag. Like if uh, you finish the assignment, then you could you could say tag your it and then we'd have a chase game around the house, something that gives them a break. Um, and and it, it really helps because then they can tear off that sticky note and they go to the next three or the next one or the next two. But it's really knowing your child and trusting you as a parent because you know your child, you know what they need and honor that, honor that. Um, and I think that, um, you know, just little tricks like that where it's um, breaking it down into pieces and this is what I can handle right now. And you know what? If your child starts to get overwhelmed, and they are just, they're done for the whatever. Email the teacher, email the school, let them know that and take a break and just say, we're done for tonight. We're gonna sit and watch a movie as a family, or you know, we're gonna, we're gonna make ice cream or make cookies, whatever it is that your family does for your downtime, for your relax, your, take that time. We all need that time in our, in our day. And if you can just take that break um, and honor that, that's what you need to do. Listen to yourself as a parent. You can do this. It's hard. It is so hard. But know what your kids need and honor that. Uh, Clark, uh, do you want to speak about having children within the district? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I currently have uh, a, a junior at Rampart and and she is very social and and she's in a lot of activities and this is it's it has been tough and and some of the things are have been tough well just not being able to be with her friends that is so important for a lot of adolescents and and um, pre-adolescents that is such a such an important way they learn is engage um, and, and for her, motivation has been harder. I mean, she is she has been doing her stuff, but she's been kind of trying to figure out and she's landing on some things of, of, of kind of like what you were saying, taking chunking it, doing a little piece, taking a break, giving yourself some kind of a reward. And then I think a lot of it, the anxiety might come up and we kind of just talk through that a little bit. Yeah, this is anxious times. I, I, I can see why that would be cause some anxiety. And sometimes when you know, when we go to the worst case scenario, you know, sometimes we, a lot of us might do that kind of with anxiety, go to the catastrophe, like what if this happens and this happens and this happens? And sometimes it helps to say, OK, so what if that does happen? And they realize, oh, we'll actually survive. And and so for them to, I think, hear us when we're being calm kind of helps. We have one more question and it is surrounding the effects of the isolation. The reality is that we will have a large population of kids who have not thrived during isolation who are going to fail classes. This adds a lot of stress to kids who already feel despondent. Is District 20 looking ahead to what is about to hit the grade books? And the answer is yes, our principals are well aware as well as our counselors um, are well aware of of that and that students are failing. Uh, if you have concerns specifically about your student, I um, please contact your school administrator and or counselor and discuss that with them. Uh, we certainly don't want to uh, punish kids at this time with everything that we've been going through, all of us with isolation. Um, and we um, you know, contacting your school administrator would be the best thing there um, as far as those grades. Our time is up tonight. Uh, we thank you so much for your participation. There were a lot of questions. Uh, we will look at them and we will try to answer them and, and perhaps post that on our website or uh, share in an email so that we can, um, you know, give 
give your question attention and, and answer those. Uh, if you have not completed the evaluation, that link at the beginning of the chat is a pretty short survey um, just to get your input and any ideas you have for future parent academies. We'd also like to share that uh, the recording will be available on our website, on our parent, on the D20 website, uh, on the Parent Academy page. It takes a couple of days to get that up uh, because we have to transcribe it. Uh, also, the PowerPoint, we will share that. And the handouts that were talked about tonight, the, um, the, the self-care plan, right? And there was one other, but we will share we will share those as well. Um, thank you. If we don't have a chance, um, we'd like to wish you all a wonderful holiday season, despite the circumstances, and know that we are truly in this together. And uh, certainly, contact me or contact your school um, with with issues or questions, and we will do the best we can to help you and support you in that. Thank you again, and have a wonderful evening. Goodbye.